Hello and welcome to the latest video in my series on A-Level System Software. Today we're going to look at scheduling. So, let's take a brief overview here. Multitasking operating systems need to make sure that multiple processes can run alongside each other apparently simultaneously. And that's something that we looked at earlier. In addition, multi-user operating systems may have a number of users sharing a system without any apparent delay. For both of these to be possible, operating systems need to carry out scheduling, and this is the job of the scheduler. A scheduler is a program that manages the amount of time different processes have in the CPU. So if you can imagine all these different processes running, want as much CPU time as possible. You need some kind of, I don't know, door guard, bouncer there to make sure that only the most important processes get access straight away and that less important processes have to wait a little bit longer. So the scheduler ensures that the computer processes as many tasks as possible in the least amount of time. Fairly ensures that no task is left uncompleted for too long, even if it is low priority still has to get dealt with eventually. It makes efficient use of CPU time. Minimizes the delay between a user request and the task being completed. And maximizes the number of users with fast response times. There are a number of different algorithms a scheduler can use, including round robin, first come first served, shortest job first, shortest remaining time, and multi-level feedback cues. So some of these can be a little bit similar, so listen carefully to the description, make some good notes, and make sure you don't get mixed up or confused when you actually come to your exam. Let's start with round robin, the simplest algorithm. In round robin scheduling, each process is given a fixed amount of time. If it hasn't finished by the end of that time period, it goes to the back of the queue so the next process in line can have its turn. So you can see here in this diagram, it's the turn of process 5. It gets to go into the CPU. It'll be given a limited number of processor cycles. And when that number of cycles is completed, even if the process hasn't finished, it goes to the back of the queue, and then the next process, process 20, gets its turn with the CPU. So round robin has some advantages. It is simple to implement. And it is a good algorithm if all the processes are approximately the same size and the same priority. However, round robin does not take into account the priority or the importance of a process. It does not consider the size of a process, which can make it a very inefficient way to allocate resources. The next one we're going to look at is first come, first served which sounds like the title of a 1950s Ealing comedy. This is similar to round robin, except each process is allowed to run to completion. First come, first served is a lot like queuing for a shop, something that we British are very good at. The first process to arrive is dealt with by the CPU until it is finished. Meanwhile, any other processes that come along are queued up to wait for their turn. Just like in a shop, when the person in front has a particularly full shopping trolley, if the process being run takes a lot of time, then all the other processes have to wait. So if you've got one item, and somebody in the queue has a full shopping basket, you have to wait for all of their shopping to be scanned and put away before you get a chance. So first come, first served advantages. Again, like round robin, it is a simple algorithm to implement. Once a process starts, it will run to completion in the minimal amount of time for that one. However, it does prevent other processes from running until this one is finished being completed. And it does not consider the priority or the size of the process. The next one is shortest job first. Shortest job first picks the job that will take the shortest time measured in fetch, decode, execute cycles, and run it until it is finished. So, of course, this is an estimate. It's estimating how many fetch, decode, execute cycles each process will take to be completed. 
and then it will start with the one that takes the least. In this diagram, it's process 7, and that goes into the CPU first. And then after that, it would be process 5, process 20, and so on and so forth, based on this estimated number of processor cycles. With shortest job first, if a new process comes along, the scheduler works out the processing time and slots it into the queue at the appropriate place. What's interesting, though, is if it is shorter than the other processes, the one currently running is interrupted and the shorter one runs immediately. So if the CPU is working its way through one process and a new one is launched that takes less time, it gets to interrupt what's currently being executed and replace it for the CPU. So we'll look more at how interrupts work in another video. So again, let's look at the advantages. It ensures that the maximum number of jobs are completed. And it ensures that short jobs aren't kept waiting while a long process ties up resources. However, the scheduler can only estimate the number of cycles. And this could be wrong. Long jobs may never be completed if shorter jobs keep joining the queue. And as with the others, this does not take into account the priority of the process. Moving on to shortest remaining time. Don't mix that up with shortest job first. So shortest remaining time. A problem with shortest job first is that if a 1000 cycle program is running and a 700 cycle process joins the queue, the 1000 cycle process will be interrupted even if it has only one cycle remaining until it has been completed. In this algorithm, shortest remaining time, the schedule orders jobs by how much time they have remaining rather than the total length. So therefore it's a little bit more efficient because it's looking at the remaining cycles left, not the total length. If a job is added with a shorter remaining time, then the scheduler can still switch to that one. So advantages of shortest remaining time. Again, short processes are handled very quickly. Ensures that the maximum number of jobs are completed while still taking into account what has happened so far. However, again, long jobs may never be completed if shorter jobs keep joining the queue. Does not take into account the priority of the process. A more advanced one is what we call multi-level feedback queues. This takes into account the priority or the importance of a task by maintaining queues with different priority levels. So when a process arrives, it is placed into the relevant queue. So a new priority, a new process is launched, and that process can either be assigned to be a low-level, a mid-level, or a high-level priority job. Obviously, the high-level tasks will be worked through first, then the mid-level, and then the low-level. So again, high priority is completed first, and then the other queues in turn. But the algorithm can move processes between these two queues at any time, depending on new information or if a low-priority job has been waiting too long. So sometimes the priority of a task may change, or if it's been waiting too long, it may be boosted by the scheduler so that it gets completed in a reasonable amount of time. So the advantage of multi-level feedback queues is that it makes much more sophisticated use of process priority. It also ensures high priority tasks run on time. However, it is more complex to implement. It's not efficient if all the processes have a similar priority, so they'd all join the same queue. And low priority tasks may take a long time to complete if the algorithm does not take into account the wait time. So again, you do need this more complicated algorithm that can realize when a process has been waiting for too long. In a real computer system, of course, schedulers have been designed to use a blend of algorithms. So for example, if the scheduler detects that most of the processes are of similar priority and processing length, then it could easily switch to round robin, which is a simple algorithm to implement, and in this situation, wouldn't be, you wouldn't lose any efficiency. 
However, if a number of high priority processes appear, the scheduler could then switch to the multi-level feedback queue algorithm in order to make sure those high priority tasks get done first. Of course, there is no one perfect scheduling algorithm. So thank you for joining me for this look at scheduling. Of course, in real life, it does get more complicated. This is just a kind of broad overview. Make sure you know the differences between each type of scheduling. Make sure you know the relative strengths and advantages. And I will see you in the next video.